Good evening, everyone. My name is Robert T. Green. I'm the CEO of Pre Post Game, and thank you guys for joining us on the African American Athlete Radio slash Pre Post Game Podcast on May the second, two thousand and eighteen. This podcast is sponsored by the African American Athlete, hosted by Mr. Ricky Hampton and Michael Robinson. Be sure to check these guys out on Tuesdays from 10 p.m. Eastern to 11 p.m. Eastern as they cover all topics regarding African-American history and sports uh, for the benefit of the athlete and the families of those that support these wonderful gentlemen. Um, again, as I said, I'm, I'm Robert T. Green. I'm the CEO of my company called Pre Post Game. I'm also formerly known as the Players Rep. And my job is to educate and empower, protect the athlete and the family's best interests alone. Um, we're going to be doing the NFL 2018 recap. Some of the topics we'll be discussing is Mr. Lamar Jackson being drafted in the first round. How many kids were advised to return to school that in essence end up turning into undrafted free agents? How does the uh, best quarterback in the Big Ten history, Mr. JT Barrett, end up going undrafted? Um, how to hold some of these analysts such as Mel Kuyper accountable? i um, let you guys know I'm the only person, and again, it's on record that basically I said that Baker Mayfield would be drafted number one. However, if you look at some of the comments or some of the sections since after the draft, I've seen a couple of reports that where someone gave Mel Kuyper credit for saying uh, he got it right. Um, and that's a problem because a lot of times families and athletes kind of dictate or kind of follow the direction of some of these pundits and how now some of these guys are in, in a world of hurt regarding that. Also, how to hold some of these colleges and these coaches and universities accountable when, again, you talk about is about education, but they blatantly go out their way to interfere for selfish purpose reasons to uh, dictate what happens to an athlete in his professional career. And because it never comes out that way, um, a lot of times the families are stuck feeling um, betrayed and um, used and abused. And literally um, the day that these kids uh, basically decide to declare, uh, if that's not what the school wants, then one, not only the school doesn't return their phone calls or congratulate them after the draft prior to, they're, they're going out their way to, talk negatively to certain people such as NFL scouts and GMs against those kids. And if that's the right route they want to take, so be it. But at the end of the day, if that's what they're going to do, that information needs to be disseminated back to the future recruits. So again, if that's the type of uh, business you want to conduct yourself with in certain schools, and um, let's look out for the next couple of days where there's going to be a lot of different power five parents, if you will, um, that went through some of these scenarios that's going to put these things out there to really let other parents know that before you invest or sign that letter of intent to go to that school, understand the type of people that you're dealing with and what you need to understand so you protect yourself going forward. So, again, I'm excited about this. I spent the entire week keeping my mouth shut, um, watching certain things. And, again, regarding um, any questions you guys may have, please like make sure you go to the comment section. Post on Mr. Ricky Hampton, who was here. How you doing, Mr. Hampton? Will um, basically... Re reiterate them to me and I'll try to answer them to my best of my knowledge and ability um, non-biased of course because that's what it's about it's just giving you the facts about the business of sport and that's what we're going to do today so first and foremost because um, the media or the powers that be or the shows you watch every day you haven't understand and don't understand the impact of what Lamar Jackson just did regarding the sports business in the world today as we know it 2018 for those who don't know recap uh, Mr. Lamar Jackson was a junior in college who um, declared for the NFL draft early, although many pundits, um, you know, I mentioned Mel Kuyper earlier, suggested that he to return to school because he didn't feel like he was a first, second, or third round quarterback in that matter. Uh, Mr. Lamar Jackson decided to turn pro, and instead of hiring an agent, Mr. Lamar um, decided to represent himself, represent himself. Because uh, once again, in the NFL and, and NBA, in the NHL and MLB, all of the first contracts in pro sports are what they talk about slotted. There's already a salary set in place for a certain amount of years. There's really little to no negotiations regarding certain things. Um, some of the negotiations that do take place, whether it's talking about offset language or deferred payments based off of tax purposes, that's something that um, literally, if you really was to invest in your business that you're trying to get into, the CBA... The amount of money, for example, the 2019 draft class in the NFL or the NBA is already, you know, what that amount, that dollar amount is going to be. Um, one of the most important things is to find out is where actual city or state you're going to be playing in. For example, there's such a thing called a millionaire tax where you have that in uh, Washington, New York, Washington, D.C., I'm sorry, New York, New Jersey, uh, California, obviously, then other places such as. Um, Washington State doesn't have a personal income tax. So understanding where you may or may not be and where that money is going to come and how it's going to come 
is one of the main things uh, pertaining to your draft status. It all falls down to your tape, your age, and how healthy you are. Uh, if any of those things are going, you know, the opposite direction, your draft status and stock goes down. If all those things are in your favor, your draft status goes up. It doesn't matter what sport. That's what people don't realize. At the end of the day, the reality, most of these people that's in the industry dealing with these kids and treating them as kids, not as professionals, is banking on that they're uneducated, unprepared, and basically focused on the game and nothing else. Um, that includes how much money they're going to get paid, how much they're going to lose, and so forth. So, so since Mr. Jackson decided to represent himself, he hired his mother as an agent, meaning she's going to manage everything regarding his process, whether it's the training, whether it's the, the set up the meetings, whether it's the set up the, the uh, different type of areas where, you know, you got to get Lamar in certain areas in front of certain people. So she did that. Now, going into that draft, many people talked about, speculated where he may go or may not go. Once again, it's not as, as exciting or as expensive as it should be based off what you know if you actually understand the draft. In particular, the NFL draft and um, the quarterbacks are already in the National Football League. The teams that draft the quarterbacks in the first round, Baltimore, um, you know, Cleveland, uh, who else? Baltimore, Cleveland, um, Baltimore, Cleveland, Buffalo, and there's a couple more. I don't know why I'm just having brain whatever right now. But at the same time, those five teams, the Jets, uh, yeah, the Jets, there you go, and Arizona. So those five teams in particular, they all knew and be known to need quarterbacks. So when they took quarterbacks or how they took quarterbacks or which quarterback they took, it really wasn't a question. It was just when and where. And the fact of the matter is, even with some teams coming up in this actual CBA-generated uh, draft, some of the quarterbacks, which I'm so happy to see Saquon Barkley go number two, is because there are quarterbacks that you hear that aren't even ready to play. But for whatever reason, that stigma or that, that statement about this is a quarterback-driven league or whatever that may be, these guys get this first round or this highly guaranteed bonuses and yet they never got to touch the field, not for a while anyway. Um, so once again, when Lamar Jackson didn't get drafted in the first four, um, the teams that may have took him or needed a quarterback possibly for the future, um, the New Orleans Saints and the Baltimore Ravens. Um, and again, Baltimore traded back with Mr. Ozzie Newsom. And this is his last, again, he's an African-American GM. This was his last uh, draft pick uh, draft for the, for the um, NFL, the Baltimore Ravens. He's going to be turning over those duties to someone else. So, Congratulations, Mr. Newsom, on an awesome career as an executive in the National Football League, uh, conducting yourself with class and integrity as an African-American athlete. Um, as a role model for guys such as myself that understand this is business and at the end of the day um, to remain true to your business. So um, Lamar Jackson, for all intents and purposes, we talk about breaking down, like I said, his age, his numbers, and his also health. Um, Mr. Lamar Jackson was very healthy. Um, he's broken every record you want to talk about. Uh, numbers as far as passing and running in the NCAA, he's actually, uh, if, correct me if I'm wrong, he outrushed Saquon Barkley in his college career in three years. Uh, and so, again, at the same time, he also played in a system, a highly rated, I mean, a, a tough pro-rated system under Bobby Petrino. So, once again, even in his pro day, to, to avoid some of the questions, Mr. Uh, Jackson even um, participated in doing drills with a center, uh, not just in shotgun, to show all of his wealth and show all of his worth regarding playing the quarterback. So for those who don't understand, although he was drafted number 32, what Mr. Jackson and his mother did, which is a pioneer in itself, is that by not running at 40, by not um, running routes, he basically told the world, no matter who has something to say, that I am a quarterback. Understanding the business of the National Football League, when you're a quarterback, you get paid accordingly and royally, regardless. What would have happened, even though people may say, well, how do you know that? Just understand what I'm saying. I know this is why I'm in this business. If he were to run routes, if he was to run that 40, there would have been someone that all said, well, you know what? Mr. Lamar Jackson, and here the word, is a project. We don't know if he's a quarterback. We don't know if he's a wide receiver. We're going to bring him into camp. We're going to see. Term project takes Lamar Jackson out of the first round, regardless of his number 32, and pushes them all the way down to the fourth round. Now, from a team's perspective, what they say all the time is getting a steal. NFL is completely different than college. College, when they recruit you, they tell you how much they love you. They tell you how much they want to be there for you, how they're going to help you become a better person, yada, yada, yada. Although a lot of these things are not true, the NFL model is completely different. They are there to dissect you, to make sure all the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted. Because now, you're going to be compensated for what you can do. And at the same time, because of that, 
if you do something that basically, professionally speaking, they can use against you, they will. That's no fault of theirs. That's no that's the fault of yours. That's why we say sports is not a game. It's all business. So the fact of the matter is, by him remaining a quarterback and letting it be known and never wavering on that, being drafted as a quarterback allowed him to be drafted in the first round. His mother, as his manager, an African-American quarterback, number 32, $9 million guaranteed. He's a quarterback. He's going to camp for the Baltimore Ravens as a quarterback. Your life expectancy in sports is already short-lived. If you take time to basically allow people, no matter what their thoughts and, and how they feel, to move you around left and right, in the NFL in particular, or even in the NBA, they talk about consistency. Mr. Jackson was consistent. He was consistent with how he played the game. He was consistent how he conducted himself around people. He was consistent about his strength and his belief in his mom and his system and in his process that he trusted his process. I repeat, his process. He trusted his process, not the process. And the result of that is that you have a young man now in Baltimore who over the last few years have not done really well offensively. And to add him to that offense, and also they know that he's recently brought in RG3, it's clearly you can see that the changing of the guard is there. RG3 mistakes may be able to help uh, Mr. Jackson to avoid some of those same mistakes regarding sliding or with a thin frame or um, handling some of the pressures as, again, a, a African-American quarterback coming in the spotlight. So the reality is that you have to understand that at any time and any day that when your number is called, you got to be able to move forward and be successful in that. And because, again, Mr. Jackson is a quarterback, he's not going to camp right now trying to figure out what he's going to do or what he's not going to do. And that's a blessing. So, again, you don't see it on TV. You don't hear about it that much. But, again, we teach this and how to do this at prepostgame.com, how to invest in yourself, not the industry. Um, because uh, the CBA and because of technology and because of social media and platforms, no different than marketing, so many different things you can do today that you wasn't able to do many, many, many years ago. But the fact of the matter is you have to stop watching so much TV because, again, the TV and the pundits are there to persuade your thought process or to devalue your thought process or to value even having a thought process to fall in line. Because that, excuse me, that in essence allows other people to dictate to you and tell you how you should go about your business and then you'll be paying them. So um, kudos to Mr. Jackson, to his mother. I am extremely honored and proud. And, again, as the player's rep um, for what you accomplished, it is something that, um, again, we're going to see more of in the future. Um, I'm sure of it because that's just what we do every day, all day. But like anything else, if it was about me, you would hear more about it. But at the end of the day, it's not. It's about the players, it's about the family. And that's what we're talking about there. So um, thank you for that. So that leads me to the next topic. The 2018 draft. I've seen so many athletes and their families just uh, distraught regarding the times they were getting drafted and where they was at. And some of these highly rated prominent agents that many of you know, um, no need to name their names because, again, it proves the point that it does not matter who your agent is. It matters, again, your body of work, what you put on film. It matters your body, period, how healthy it is. And it matters what you are able to do from a personality and an actual ability to sell tickets, help the team win standpoint. So, when you have kids that are um, questioning or, or concerned about whether they should leave school early or not, and a lot of people, once again, we spoke all the time about getting your, get your education. Um, there was actually a study that came out the other day talking about there's only kids that actually don't even play sports only get about two hours a, a day of real studies. And then, and there's also a, a young man out of Florida that just talked about after he finishes getting his education that the difficulties that he's has to actually get a job in America and not even understanding the jobs that he's applying for, how can he actually get them? A lot of those things that's being asked of him, he don't understand. And he has his degree. So going back to those young men and their families that were advised to stay in school with, with the notion that, oh, if you stay in school, you'll improve your draft stock. But when in essence, these young men and their families end up becoming undrafted free agents, which ultimately gave the university another year of free labor, another year of injury risk, and a lot of times where a kid may get injured and never be able to recoup that money again. So if you were projected as a fourth-round pick or a fifth-round pick where it's not a lot of guaranteed money, but enough to say that if you were an undrafted free agent, there's no guaranteed money, maybe 10000 if you're if you're a preferred free agent to go along with that. 
Um, so there's so many people that, that actually experience that year in and year out, but none of that stuff is heard or promoted or talked about. Because once again, the people that write or has written the actual rules, if you will, um, is written them to actually make sure that the players that without them, they wouldn't have a business model um, or silenced or so disgusted and distraught and prideful that they don't even feel comfortable speaking out. But once again, I encourage those parents, if you wanted those parents to speak out. Uh, because at the end of the day, if you don't speak out on behalf of your son and, your, and, and if your son don't speak out on behalf of himself, these things will continue. And what we don't want to continue to happen is have other highly rated recruits go through this same process and these people think it's OK. Um, like I said, selfishly speaking, if you don't want a kid to return to school and he decides not to, it is not right, not fair. And it's also highly unprofessional to go out your way to slam this kid's character to NFL scouts, NFL GMs. Uh, owners, presidents, anybody like that simply because at the end of the day, they didn't do what you wanted them to do. They are student athletes, but they're human beings first. They also soon to be professionals. And because you slandered their actual name in regarding costing them, you know, sometimes millions of dollars in regard to that, um, these people need to start to be addressed. These universities need to start to be addressed. And one of the things that it, we can do right off the bat to address it is that when the, the uh, future recruits for that same position or in a position to go to that school, you know, let them talk to those parents and those kids and those, those, those NFL players that are in the league right now. And then let them have the answer to it. Because the reality is that's the system. You, you, you bring them in, assembly line, you push them out. And once again, it, it's, it's been happening for, for decades, you know, decades. And uh, for me, it's nothing like, you know, at the end of the day, these young men get an opportunity. So free agent or not, it's a blessing. Um, you have the opportunity, but at the same time, you would have a better opportunity if you were given the right factual information by those that claim when they sit in your living room to care about your best interests. Uh, again, I talk about trust the facts, not the process. Uh, these are the facts we're talking about. If you're willing to sign your name on a letter without even addressing these things or, or for somebody that's a five star recruit and you want to believe that they are not being told by that college that's recruiting them that they come there, they're going to get them to the NFL and it could be a first round pick. It will be one. Um, that's, that's the situation where you have to start really sitting back and just looking at, you know, what's happening over years. The information is out there. Uh, question, how do we keep kids from getting caught up in their so-called glamour of being recruited by D1? That's a great question, but honestly, it's really not a direct answer. It's a, it's more of a personalized answer. Um, this is my own experience being a, a formerly highly recruited athlete. Um, as a kid, it comes from sometimes a lot of urban areas where, you know, um, you know, kids are poor, families are poor. And you're that one kid that, you know, people believe that is going to make it, whether you go in the barbershop or you go to 7-Eleven, everybody knows your name and telling you how great you are and making you feel like you never felt before. Um, again, the Division One, I, Division One AA sports period at that level has basically captured the ability to 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 exploit that um, by you know giving this kid whether it's a some gloves or a jersey or a couple graphic designs or a couple mentions on social media or or, or a, a TV show, and in essence, what you now done is now you've given that university once again all the power by saying, although I am the best here. I am subservient to them. Um, and again, that's a, a, a scenario where, um, like any business, you go to work every day. You Everybody's happy about getting their job or getting a job or having a job, getting compensated for it. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about, according to their rules, is going to school. There again, people say what they want to say. There's not a Division One, two, three, four, five athlete that is happy about going to school. They may be happy about going and get the opportunity to get the education, to put themselves in the best situation in life for their families, whether it's on the field or off the field. But just to say to get up and I'm so happy to go to school, then again, you're not understanding what we're going on in this business. Um, again, the glamour comes from the kids that's basically the people around them um, to keep them grounded. Um, but I can be honestly speaking, we talk about the term sports trafficking. Um, there's more people that's going to actually want this kid to become that or act that way simply because they want to feel like they are responsible for uh, helping them get to a certain point. And once again, uh, a five-star recruit is no more uh, of, a, of a celebrity than someone that goes to work every day in a hotel that that, that services uh, millionaires and billionaires. 
bottom line is that you, you are now in a certain group around a certain group of people. But at the same time, you, you may be around, have that status, but you're not getting compensated as them. You're not basically getting opportunities as them. You still have a fine line and a long way to go to get to where you want to be. So um, once again, it's, but it's, it's easier said than done. Uh, again, I talk about start with the end in mind. Uh, one of the things you can do is teach a kid who actually has a goal to become a professional athlete. That's what they really want to do. Understand that the pros and cons of being a professional athlete, what comes along with it. But also say that, hey, this is where the end is. The end is, is that in your early 30s, if you're lucky, you're already out of that league in that business. And if that's so, then what are you going to do now? Once you can start bringing those things together and help that kid, you know, put piece to piece, he'll start to look toward or she'll start to look toward the end first and then put the right foundation and the right steps in place to accomplish those goals. And then everything else becomes secondary. Um, I, I, I had a conversation with a family the other day. You know, everybody talk about being a top 10 pick, a top 20 pick, whatever it may be. I always take the top 10. Top 10 this year in this draft, Josh Rosen was... Uh, you get $17 million over the next four years with a um, $10 million signing bonus with a fifth-year team option. Now, again, that's pick 10. Now, I heard Mr. Josh Allen say a lot. Of, I mean, Josh Rosen, I apologize, say a lot of things about how the NFL teams make nine mistakes and how this is this and how is that. Now, you got to ask yourself this. If you was doing something yesterday, you working hard to accomplish it, and then, you know, by the end of the week, you're going to be compensated four years $17 million over four years. Would you not be happy? If you didn't know, if you're working to basically compete and do this for yourself, does it matter really that someone else is getting the same opportunity? If you didn't know nine other players, nine other people are getting a different type of check, does it not make you as appreciative for the blessing that you received? A lot of times these athletes look at some of these things and they get so caught up in it and they're not even to, able to function properly. Um, because of the undue pressure they put on themselves instead of just going out there and doing what they normally do to get to this point. Um, I hope Mr. Rosen now realizes that even though he was drafted number 10, he's in a pretty good spot in Arizona, still in the West Coast, where people know him. The weather is warm, which is always good for quarterbacks. He also plays um, on turf. So once again, that gives the receiver a better opportunity. So uh, the point I'm making is that, you know, athletes that are going pro or, or trying to go pro, you're not competing against anyone but yourself. The only thing you can do is can control what you can control. Um, but once again, there's so many different factors out there, or people out there that want to um, assure you based off what they do that they can change the outcome, and they can't. Um, and again, speaking of Mr. Rosen, not to uh, get too far off again, but you know there was a, his former coach, Mr. Jim Mora, who had a lot of derogatory things to say or sideways things to say um, about him and his personality and what he wants to do. Now, I, I am the biggest proponent and the strong proponent of saying, one, Mr. Moore no longer has a job at the NCAA. So once again, you talk talking about in a school. We talk about privacy. We're talking about um, confidentiality. As a kid, you talk about as a coach, you want him to trust you. You want him to open up to you. You want him to basically uh, be able to, to, to communicate with you. Yet you no longer have a job there in the school. And two, so you find that it's in your best interest or your self-serving interest to go to disparage a young man trying to fulfill their dreams. Um, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking and it's also deplorable um, by every sense of the word. And the reason why it continues to happen because guys do not call out Jim Mora for his actions. So if Mr. Mora was to get another job college in college coaching today, um, if, again, how we operate in our business, knowing how he's operated publicly, how you ask a kid to conduct himself professionally and not embarrass himself and not bring attention to himself self to stay away from distractions, but yet, at the end of the day, you want him to buy into the team. Josh Rosen was no longer part of that team. So what made Mr. Moore feel, like I said, comfortable and confident of to speak on that guy such as that? You know, this is the same thing that happened a few years back with Miles Jack. Uh, when he didn't want Miles Jack, again, self-serving. He's not ready. Well, again, you're going back to what you keep saying in the NCAA that this is about education. There shouldn't be any coaches commenting on these kids' professional business. When There shouldn't be no universities advising a kid to stay in school. There should be no conflict of interest with networks, with agents that's sitting there um, talking about, hey, tell this kid to come out, tell this kid to stay. It's self-serving. These are things that, once again, no one is talking about and understand 
Because at the end of the day, you could tell us that it's about education, but everything says it's not. Everything says you're sports trafficking. Everything says is that if this kid doesn't stay in school, you will lose your job. Everything says is that if this kid doesn't do what you want him to do, you're willing to become a source for someone in the pros to disparage this young man's name. Now, once again, but everybody wants these kids to basically be acquiesced and, and be subservient and commit to them and the team and their structure and their process. Um, I wouldn't hire him. Um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't even acknowledge him at this point anymore. Like I said again, when you when you when somebody shows you who you are the first time, believe them. Uh, again, your father coach, his father coach in the NFL. That's great. Once again, that's how you if you really want to think about it. That's probably more likely than not an NFL term or a, a, a sports term. More likely than not, how you got a job doesn't make you a coach. Doesn't make you a leader of men. Doesn't make you someone that they want to play for, run through a wall for. Doesn't make you someone that's competent in your way of communicating to others because you're in a space don't necessarily mean you need to be there or should be there. Um, and I hope that, again, through my company and pre-post game and our networks, we continue to identify these certain things that, once again, it doesn't matter. These are athletes. These are young men. And if you want to work with them, you need to actually respect them and be responsible to them the same way that you ask them to be to you. Um, and then their parents as well. So once again, there's a lot of different areas now. We're talking about the NCAA and new areas of, of different programs where you can go and try to play, whether it's in basketball, the NBA, um, not the NBA, but <laughs> the JBA, the NBL, uh, the JBA. I think I said that before. The NBA is looking at an NBA Junior League for these top lottery picks. Obviously, the AAFL is coming back for the football and also well as the um, – um, XFL. I'm, I'm waiting to see and get information pertaining to the age and the sports and the rule requirement pertaining to some athletes when they can go, when they can be eligible and, and to do that because uh, like for example at our company we provide character development, we provide um, direct training based on who this young man or woman in the case may be regarding their sports business and how to basically put them in situations to be successful long term on and off the field. As we say all the time as a professional athlete, your leverage is remaining when you're young. It's not when you're old. When you are retired as a pro athlete, the people that have actually, you know, was supporting you or cheering you on way back when, it's the unfortunate reality that they are now um, prepared and more than likely to cheer for someone else. Um, because you can no longer provide whatever they need um, for, for them. And whether that's monetarily speaking, um, just to be around you or the, the excitement, the whatever made the cachet, the, 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 whatever, they can no longer do that. So um, these people continue to do that. So um, I want parents, again, to start to ask questions more in depth, not so much about the school is talking about because you can get that information yourself. You really need to invest more in interviewing and vetting the people that's going to have you, have you around your children. They're your children. When you sign a letter, it's not a letter to sell your children away, although a lot of things that go into this actual situation it seems like, hey, you told me this, you told me that, you told me everything I needed to know or what I wanted to hear, per se. But now that I signed that letter, I can't find out what my kid's schedule is. I can't find out when he's coming home. I can't find out when he, he's been injured. I can't find out this or that. And all the different things that go into this actual business, whether it's concussions or injuries or getting surgery, those are not decisions that an 18, 19 year old kid should be making um, without the actual, um, you know, advice of their parents or the one loved ones or someone that is directly tied to them long term, not just from a, a monetary value or to keep the school out of a certain spotlight. So uh, this this is um, something that, like I say, my term is business is business. Athletes need to basically hold these schools, parents need to hold these schools and these coaches accountable the same way that these schools and these coaches and these leagues hold them accountable. Um, this is 2018 sports world. This is not the 40s and the 50s. Um, a lot of time, a long time ago, people would say, get your education, get your education. When they were saying that, a lot of times from an African-American athlete standpoint, people would say, well, I'm the first one to, to go to college in my family. And although that's an, a blessing and also a, a, an honor, uh, today's world in sports, and not just sports, but in school, there's things such as um, the internet. It wasn't around before. Technology, a lot of things you can learn that you actually can focus on, you can get on your own. You can go to school online. Um, I don't understand we talk about education, which means I can go somewhere and literally put myself in debt in order to try to find a job to never get out of debt. I, I don't really call that education. I call that a business. And sometimes in that business, you also call it a monopoly. Because who else in any other business can basically, whether it's the NCAA or the university, can put out, hey, you know, 
you can go to school and get an education, but don't have any results when it comes with a job. Does this education, this debt I'm taking, does this going to guarantee me a job? No. So once again, how smart is that? For these young men, as I was mentioning, that actually spent, you know, the last five months out they were advised to stay in school and end up becoming undrafted free agents. Why would they sign an agreement, a contractual agreement with an agent for something five months in advance that they don't know what's going to happen? Only to have the agent say, oops, sorry, don't know what happened. You still not have to compensate that actual agent. You now have to compensate this, this, this Uncle Sam. You still might have to actually compensate a lot of other people, whether it's the trainers, whether it's the people that you owe, you borrow money from. They're not going to sit back and say, oh, we sorry, you got drafted. We, or you were undrafted free agent. You're a business now. Your signature's on the line. You have not to pay them back. You might, some, some, some athletes end up spending their first couple years based on the same scenario, working, playing football in particular, for free. And as, and as sad, once again, after the education, after the, the uh, you know, five or six months of trust in the process. Sports is not a game. Sports is all business. That's the recap. Like I said, my name is Robert T. Green. I'm the CEO of Pre Post Game. This is the Pre Post Game podcast sponsored by the African American Athlete and host Ricky Hampton. Check them out. Him and Michael Robinson every Tuesday from 10 p.m. to 11 p.m. You can also find out all the articles they write about daily at www.theafricanamericanathlete.com. Um, like I said, great insight from Mr. Hampton. Um, obviously, for me and, and my perspective, I, I focus on the business side because at the end of the day, this is what it is. A lot of people as fans, a lot of people as athletes, a lot of people as parents, they have emotional ties to everything that goes on in their sports and their teams, and, and rightfully so. Everybody wants to feel belonged. Everybody wants to have their bragging rights. But unfortunately, from an athlete standpoint, they have to understand that that's exactly what they are. Um, this is a situation right now, even now, 2019, it's already a, a Vegas odds and a Vegas betting line on who's going to actually end up the worst record last year or next year or the over and under from wins and losses. So it lets you know it's all business. Um, but because again, they are making bets off of those players that are coming into the league or leaving out the league. Um, there were 255 guys drafted. Again, congratulations to them and their families. Um, there's another amount of guys that were assigned as uh, free agents. And then there's another group of kids, about 70, that's going to be going into camp t- as a not a free agent, but an unsigned free agent. Like basically, you get an actual workout to see if you can actually try to make the team. And in essence, if you actually perform better than some of the free agents, you may have an opportunity to get signed because the free agent really doesn't have any guaranteed money. Which leads me to one of my next points. JT Barrett. JT Barrett, the former quarterback of Ohio State, also African-American. Uh, the best quarterback statistically, best quarterback in Big Ten history. Played under Urban Meyer for four years. The fact that JT Barrett can play for a school at the Ohio State University and go undrafted is only two things that you can say. One, Urban Meyer and the old University of Ohio State, Ohio State University, did not, yeah, I'm aware of that, yep, I'm sorry, did not, um, did not teach him, well, again, to play quarterback at the National Football League level, or he never had it in the first place. So it's one of two things. Either he, he was never that good or Urban Meyer wasn't a good coach. But once again, um, you got another group of quarterbacks that's going to go to Ohio State too again. Again, you talk about Alabama. How many quarterbacks have been successful in National Football League? Be the greatest coach in the world in a quarterback-driven league. How many quarterbacks have you had that were successful in the National Football League? I don't need to give you the answers. The answer is so simple it's not even funny. Zero. How many has Urban Meyer had? If you can't count Count Newton, zero. Sports is not a game. Sports is all business. African American quarterbacks, if you're going to go to play for a school, again, if your goal is to play in the National Football League, you want to be a quarterback, understand what a pro style offense looks like. Understand where it is. Understand how to actually um, position yourself in it so you don't spend four years winning rings and championships. For other people only to tell you that, hey, after I won all these rings for you and I'm so great here, that the pro the pro level says you're not that good. That's heartbreaking. That's that's something that most kids do not deal with well. And they nor should they. I didn't commit four years of my time in my life and be, and believing what you told me only to find out that it really wasn't factual. Now, I'm going to leave that alone for there because once again, this is something that happens continuously. But. Um, just to recap, you know, Colin Kaepernick had filed a uh, collusion 
case against the um, NFL. And then Eric Reed, who um, was a young man that took a knee alongside uh, Colin, is a relatively young Pro Bowl, former Pro Bowl safety, who still hasn't been signed as of yet. Uh, and Mr. Reed has now uh, joined the collusion suit with Colin Kaepernick. Now, again, this is like I said before, and I'll say it again. Uh, do I agree necessarily with the NFL and their stance on how, if you want to call it blackballing Colin Kaepernick? No, I do not. Do I want Colin Kaepernick to stand up if he feels like he don't need to stand up? No, I do not. But it goes back to the business where the NFL, for all the things that they have done and continue to do, and what's in their context and their agreements from a financial standpoint, from a rules and regulation standpoint, the only thing that can change this, and again, unfortunately, I don't, in my opinion, in my professional humble opinion, I don't believe it's suing. It starts back when you first get to the league through your own players' union and reps. Uh, just the two years ago, you know, dancing like Antonio Brown and Odell Beckham had the NFL fine players upwards of $35 million. But the CBA is coming up um, in 2021 with a potential lockout. So it's not by accident, in my opinion, that all of a sudden uh, these guys can start dancing again. Um, and now, once again, you could dance or even if you got high, that's again, if players basically give up the right to, 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 to get high or give up money to get high and give up money to dance once again, and let you know that it's not the NFL that we should be focused on. It should be us, uh, us meaning like African-American athletes, athletes, a period. Because once again, if you basically are willing to sacrifice long-term stability, financial, uh, uh gain, and, 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 you know, a sense of worth and pride, then you can't blame anyone else besides yourself. Now, um, speaking of Eric Reed, he has a younger brother who um, just got drafted, I believe, by the Tennessee Titans. A really good kid. Uh, I believe his name is Justin. Uh, and again, even now, you know, a lot of pundits want to ask Justin about that. And Justin is saying, like, I'm just here to try to make the team, which he should. Because each individual case, once again, talk about the business side of, of the sport. Uh, there's a lot of things that athletes can do to basically um, make their voices known, known and make their, their, their situations um, better. But it all starts back to, again, when you're young, knowing your worth and keep maintaining your leverage. That's why I talked about what Mr. Um, what Mr. Uh, Jackson did. Now, if you go back to whole, this whole scenario, whether it's taking a knee or the, the, the lawsuit or or things of that nature. Um, Colin Kaepernick is more than an athlete. Uh, Eric Reed is more than an athlete. Um, again, regarding other athletes that's watching them and what they take from this, they are acting, exercising their rights as Americans, black Americans, um, and regarding what they feel when a wrong has been done. This is great. In the essence that this wouldn't even happen just a matter of two years ago. As of two years ago, no one would have actually went against the National Football League regarding anything. And at the end of the day, um, it, it goes to show you that athletes start to understand that they are more than just what people tell them that they are. More than what than what people want to describe them as. And then more than what that you know they see on TV every day. Um, athletes get a lot of negative press for things that they do, and, and, and sometimes rightfully so. I'm the first person to say, you know, business is business. You got to be held, hold yourself accountable. Um, this is not something where anybody can just come out there and should be just getting paid for whatever reason. So, again, I, I stand by those that are willing to, um, you know, accept their consequences for their actions and without making excuses. But... Um, like I said, these things continue to happen where, sorry about that, athletes need to understand going forward that they just can't continue to just sit back on what happened uh, 15, 20 years ago and act like things are not going to change. That means money, that means coaches, that means uh, ownership is going to continue to change. And for them to um, basically get what they want going forward, they got to recognize what they don't have. And that's what we're going to try to continue to educate them on. Okay. Good. I'm glad, I'm glad I thought I was off for a second. Um, but really quick, I just want to um, talk about the salary. Because I talk about the actual um, 
the actual pre-draft or the actual um, what's the word? The actual I don't have some issues right now. The actual contract salaries that's actually already written in stone. So for example, Baker Mayfield who was drafted, um, his total comp value is thirty-two million dollars with a twenty-one million dollar signing bonus. Um, and then the guy right behind him, Mr. Saquon Barkley, the New York Giants, is thirty-one million with a twenty million dollar signing bonus. So uh, the fact of the matter is, you see, there's about a one million dollar difference between the first two picks. And it keeps going on and on and on from there. Uh, so the fact of the matter is, you know, because you know that's what it's going to be. Uh, again, Saquon is in New York. Sam Darnold's in New York. But Baker Mayfield's in Cleveland. So to understand the business of, okay, well, we know Baker Mayfield is not going to be tacked as much as Sam Darnold and tacked as much as Saquon Barkley. You also need to understand that every in, in the NFL, you get 17 weeks, um, 17 checks for 52 weeks. And based off all the different things that go into that actual uh, check you got to basically make sure you take care of Uncle Sam and everybody else regarding those things from there. So um, again, I just wanted to basically reiterate um, this NFL draft and and how things went. Um, again, it's it's a blessing for athletes. Again, two hundred fifty five every year, no matter what the sport, but in particular NFL, to have an opportunity to become a million night a millionaire overnight or, or overnight hundred thousand there. Uh, but you really got to understand this is a short lived career. It's a short lived window. Um, you have to invest in yourself, not the industry. You have to really be mindful and watch those that are around you and, and watch how they move. You have to become more comfortable in articulating and communicating your actions and your thoughts and your feelings to protect yourself. Uh, you cannot continue to basically, as I said again, trust the process. Uh, there are some schools out there, college universities, that literally, um, if you look at situations such as LSU, I'm um, talking about Arden Key. Uh, Saquon, I mean, um, Darius Geis, uh, Kevin Tolliver, um, these guys were, you know, top five, if, if not, you know, top one picks from an athletic ability standpoint. Um, it's amazing to me that all of a sudden, regardless of the fact what's going on, that these young men uh, fall in the draft. But we know why they fell. It's not because that they don't make mistakes. These kids do make mistakes. But who is the person that's literally talking to these teams, these scouts, and basically now um, disparaging them for who they are behind closed doors. But yet, they're in the same living room telling another kid that might be their peer, their teammate, or, or even family members how wonderful this this place is. is. And so, um, oh yeah. So, question is, people think that because you're in the NFL, you're fixed for life. Explain that why that isn't so, please. Well, the NFL, again, literally is an acronym that we say is not for long, and it's really not for long, uh, particularly when it comes to the contracts of the NFL. Unfortunately, and I don't know how this happened, but when you talk about terms such as guaranteed and fully guaranteed, it means something completely different. Um, offset language, uh, deferred, all these different things that set up that kids have no idea. Terms such as perpetuity, which stands for life. So once again, when you get a contract based off of the NFL contract, that's what it is, and you get it, um, once you get your signing bonus, whatever that may be, and again, I just mentioned Baker Mayfield. So, for example, Baker Mayfield's total value is $32 million. So that $32 million is is, is um, set up where he's going to get $21 million when he reports to camp um, on the on the actual in July. Now, Cleveland and some of these teams might do something such as defer the payments. They may say, hey, we don't have a lot of money. Can we defer this $21 million because it's guaranteed um, over these next four years? Um, and he may say yes, he may say no. Um, and then at the end of the day there, over the next four years with the fifth-year team option, that additional $11 million is going to be broken down over four years, which it comes his base salary. So once again, once that, but once that $21 million is his, so he gets that $21 million, if he goes does something that's um, contract, I mean, conduct detrimental to the team or a uh, violation of NFL policy, uh, unfortunate situation like Ray Rice, um, the NFL can void the rest of his contract and regarding that based on cost, like any other job. But that's the first pick overall. The reality is, if you just go down to, you know, the. Let's just take a six round pick, for example, and just give me a second. A six round pick. So, for people that go to work every day that, you know, are not in the NFL, and then what people can understand is that even if you're a six round pick, when you go out with your teammates, you want to impress your teammates. You want to feel like you're part of the team. You want to feel like everything and all you guys are together in this. And you can do exactly the same thing they do. 
but you really can't because you don't make the same money that they do. So the the two hundred and the two hundred and six eighteenth pick is a guy named Ade Aruna out of Tulane. Now, when we said Baker Mayfield made thirty two million dollars over four years with a fifth year team option, we said Baker Mayfield is getting twenty one million dollars guaranteed. Uh, again, but a day who's also being drafted in the sixth round, his entire contract is worth two point five million, and his guaranteed money is only one hundred and eighteen thousand dollars before taxes. One hundred eighteen thousand. Let that sit in for a second. There are people that go to work every day of the week that would not take a salary of one hundred eighteen thousand dollars. So when you now are talking about young men that's putting their body on the line. And, and, and talking about from a long-term standpoint, we're not complaining saying that's not great money. But at the same time, what did this kid know about, like I said, the state he's in? He's in Minnesota. Does he know Minnesota state taxes? Did he pay his agent 3%? Did he buy a gold chain and, and, and do this and do that because he was told he's going to be a first-round pick? Did he basically go out and tell his mom, I'm going to buy you a house and do this and do that? You can't do all those things with that type of money. And once again... Talking about 52 weeks. A lot of these kids never even lived out of their parents' houses since they went to college. But now you got to manage a home, or manage a house, manage bills, pay the government. A lot of these things are setting these kids up for failure. There's no financial literacy classes, no money management classes for these kids, even the ones that's highly rated in some of these schools. It's unfortunate. Like I said, we actually provide these type of services at pre-post game, uh, financial literacy, character development, Understanding the facts of the actual NFL, helping you to, to, to vet, audit, and monitor those that you're hiring to work on your behalf. For example, so please check us out at prepostgame.com. You can also follow me at the Players Rep here on Facebook, or you can follow me at the Players Rep 1 on um, Instagram and Twitter. And like I said, everybody that's around athletes in today's world when it comes to sport business, understand that overnight that you're going to make a certain amount of money legally. And for that in itself, it's a very, very dangerous situation to not be able to recognize those that are in the space that you are. Now, I, I, I had to tell a story one time when a former client of ours that when he was drafted, he actually um, made so much money that but he, he wanted to buy furniture. And the furniture was uh, uh, told to him after he asked his team, he asked his organization, could they help him find someone to find the furniture? And, 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 and the, the team said, sure, of course. And they directed him to someone that was proceeded to charge him $118,000 for that furniture. Now, it may seem like a lot of money, which it is. But at that time, he made so much money that $118,000 in not doing it yourself, he just rather not do it. He goes that next summer to go back to his other place way before he got traded and literally has wants to get the same furniture. But this time he does it himself. That same furniture costs thirty three thousand dollars. So in essence, that person that the team uh, connected this young athlete to um, upcharged him about eighty thousand dollars without blinking an eye. These are the people that told you to trust the process. Sports is not a game. Sports is all business. You have to invest in yourself, not the industry. You have to understand that sports is a short-lived career. Your days of playing are already numbered. You're a professional athlete as soon as someone's willing to pay money to watch you play a sport. If someone is advising you in that sport, why are they there? How did they get there? Are they trying to traffic you to somebody else on their behalf, not yours? When they speak to you, are they educating and power protecting your best interests? If you don't know what that is, then you need to find out what that is before you start to have conversations with them pertaining to what you're trying to do. Information that you share with people that you don't really know, understand, will be disseminated to somebody else. And they'll take that information that was disseminated and bring it back around and use it to befriend or turn around and traffic you. I am very happy to be on this on this actual platform every Wednesday. I look forward to bringing you guys more information. To, to educate and empower, protect your best interest in the sports business. And I'm Robert T. Green, CEO. Tune in every Wednesday right here at the African American Athlete Podcast, sponsored by the African American Athlete, presented by Pre Post Game. 
Um, again, if you have any questions from now, from this podcast, please like and share, but also send them. And like I said, we'll try to answer them next time. Um, again, check us out. Look forward to talking to you again soon. God bless.